This pin, this rather strange pin that I wear, is probably uh, describes one of the most important things going on on this planet right now. I think these, these little guys are Zeta Reticulans that uh, many, many of the abductees, UFO abductees, see in their, their secret nightlife, if you want to call it that. And I'm absolutely convinced from everything I've seen over the past 52 years that there's a long-term program to upgrade our biological computer. Anybody that knows anything about computers knows you have to upgrade your computer every now and then. I think we're getting a bigger hard drive, a faster chip, and a new USB port for telepathy. And let me show you what I think you get when you combine the genes of these two species. I think this is, although not named by Time Magazine, but this is Homo alterios spatialis, higher human from space. And these are our offspring, our children that are, have to be hidden from us until the consciousness of our neighbors changes and was willing to accept them. This picture was shown to millions and millions of people on ABC. They didn't say anything about it, but they put this picture into the consciousness of Americans, at least, and eventually the world, I think. One more time. You know you have to be somebody special to get your face on the cover of Time magazine. <laughs> this is a promo issue, 23 June 1997, for the Roswell 50th anniversary, Roswell crash, 50th anniversary. Of Certainly there is a cover-up, and all UFO researchers recognize that Project Blue Book, the most public cover-up, was, uh, was just the government's public relations agency. They did announce to the world they wanted to know about our UFO sightings and stuff, but the cases that were really worthwhile and could not be explained away by some natural or man-made object were not investigated by Blue Book, they were passed on to the real investigators. And I'm convinced that, that the U.S. or the Office of Naval Intelligence was the office of primary responsibility for, for ground, or you might say ground activities associated with the alien presence. And the reason is because their bases were in Navy territory not in Air Force territory. Although we'd see them more in the air, these things could come and go from the air down through the water, no problem. You read uh, books like uh, uh, Wendell Stevens' book, uh, Contact from uh, Undersea. It's, uh, it's a very interesting story. It was 1979 when when uh, Filiberto Cardenas was picked up, pulled up a blue beam in broad daylight with three of his friends, uh, taken to a little island. This wall opens up, he gets into a little flying saucer and he goes out over the water very fast down through the water. The water didn't touch the vehicle. Ended up in a, in a garage down there where there were a bunch of flying saucers and stuff. And the head alien down there told him there were 700 working out of that base and there are lots of other bases underground and under sea. I just saw red lights that were about, about as bright as Venus would be at its brightest, maybe a minus 4.5 magnitude, but they were wandering around in random motion and uh, obviously not aircraft or celestial objects. And my thought was, gee, is this what I read about? last Sunday morning in the newspaper because the Washington Star had flying saucers in the headlines. And so nothing more was happening. So I, uh, after about 10 minutes of watching them, so I went on to bed. It was, you know, pushing midnight by then. I got up early the next morning to get the newspaper and sure enough, again, second Sunday morning in a row, the word flying saucers was in the headlines. The aliens put on a demonstration to the extent that the the media could not ignore it, and the government couldn't cover it up. Can you imagine any president, whether it be Bush or Clinton or whatever, standing before the public and saying, yes, I am aware that we have this joint program with some aliens. 
to upgrade our biological computers, to build better bodies to house our souls in future incarnations. And we are picking up your daughters and your wives, and we're taking their eggs, we're splicing in the right genes. Some are, are a subspecies that uh, look more like us and their human mothers are allowed to raise them, but those that don't look enough like us to fit in with our society are taken at three to three and a half months. They're about that long. We put them in artificial wombs. Then we pick up the, the mothers again and we take them in and allow them to hold them within their aura to nurture them. We pick up the grandmothers sometimes for the same purpose. He says, they can't talk about things like that. If, if any president made that kind of statement, then, um, you know, because they pick them up and they, they have to put it, the altered egg in there and then they pick them up again. He wouldn't be able to do the job we hired him to do. The media would hound him to death. You know, it would be ridiculous. So I understand the reasons for the secrecy. I spent 26 years in the Air Force and I know if the government has a secret they really want to keep, they don't admit they have a secret. I was fortunate I uh, had a chance to talk to Peter Jennings for his uh, ABC special and the first question he asked me was what caused you to be interested in this subject? When I was 16 years old I was walking down the street in Arlington, Virginia and saw seven red light type UFOs over Washington that uh, made headlines around the world and since then I have seen eight alien vehicles on eight occasions. It was that, just that three seconds, alien vehicles on eight occasions that got on the ABC special. But that started me to become a truth seeker on 26 July 1952. I've read everything I could find about UFOs and the alien presence since then. At 17 I went to Duke, read a, everything in their library on the subject. Uh, American Rocket Society had the most interesting stuff. Went to the Air Force 26 years as a fighter pilot, uh, staff scientist, teacher, program manager, got a master's in nuclear engineering, retired at age 47 with 100% of my time to do whatever I wanted to do and enough money to do it. So the day, day after I retired officially, I became a field investigator and state section director for MUFON for five counties in uh, western Florida. I, uh, the next year became state director for Florida. In 89, I was elected to be the Eastern Regional Director of MUFON, overseeing the investigative activities in 18 Eastern states. In, uh, in uh, 93, I became a director of the International UFO Congress. Since 82, I have been attending six conferences a year on the average of many different types that involved expanding consciousness and UFOs. Things like uh, International Transpersonal Association conferences in uh, Clarny, Ireland and uh, uh, Noetic Sciences conferences, uh, International Conferences on Science and Consciousness. And I heard about these things called State of the World Forums that um, were, were put on by a fellow named Jim Garrison with the State of the World Forum, who is also president of the Gorbachev Foundation USA. And uh, all the world leaders were coming and basically trying to figure out what kind of a planet we want to live on in this 21st century. And I never got an invitation. You had to get an invitation to that real select group. <laughs> I was on a birding trip in Attu Island because I'm a serious birder and I was discussing government affairs in the evening hours when we weren't out birding with a gentleman from Point Reyes who was also interested in government affairs and I told him about State of the World forums and he had never heard of them. It was some miracle I think that caused an invitation for him to attend the State of the World forum, the sixth and last one held in New York City in conjunction with the UN Millennium Summit to be in his mailbox. And he didn't know, want to go and he knew I did and he just put it in the mail and said, why don't you go in my stead? So when the, when the package got there, you filled out the registration form and there's a place for title and I put, I put uh, Director International UFO Congress 
When I got there, uh, I was quite impressed. There were about 1,500 people trying to figure out the best ways to manage globalization so that the, the selfish didn't gobble up the meek and destroy the environment that supports us all. I got to participate in uh, uh, roundtables on democratizing world government, on uh, uh, getting more spirituality in the United Nations and that kind of thing. Um, I, I actually, when it came my turn to talk in that World Governance Conference, I, um, I, I suggested the people trying to decide how to get from where we are to a democratically elected world government ought to read three books. And I mentioned Timothy Good's book, Above Top Secret, because it describes one or two major UFO cases in many different countries and how that government reacted to it. And I said they should read Bud Hopkins' book, Witnessed, because this is a very good description of not, not UFOs coming here and saying, Taking, take me to your leader, but UFOs coming here and taking the Secretary General of the United Nations and putting a guilt trip on him for humanity polluting the oceans. And the third book was called, uh, was actually paper 72 in the book called The Urantia Book, A Revelation for Humanity, published in 1955 on 2,096 pages. And it, the, the title of the paper was, was Government on a Neighboring Planet. And it said at the end, the reason they gave us that was because there were ideas expressed there that would be useful on our planet at this time. Well, that conference, being an attendee, allowed me to put a, a web page on the exclusive State of the World Forum website, only accessible to those people that attended the six State of the World Forums, which include most of the heads of state. And it, um, it apparently got the attention of the president, because about a year later I received a phone call from his vice president saying, uh, Jim Garrison would like to speak with you. And I said, it's, it's going to have to be this afternoon or three weeks from now because I'm going to Thailand. And three weeks you know, later, they called at the appointed time. And, and a lovely lady named Carmen Melendres said, uh, well, unfortunately, Jim had got called out this morning. And she talked to me for about an hour about all the wild things that I, you know, the ideas I've acquired at all these conferences. And, and uh, so I started you know, sending her emails and occasionally some of the papers that I had, had written over the many years. And, and she told me later that she was forwarding all these to Jim Garrison. And the paper's about telepathic communications and UFO phenomenon. And, and one was on uh, transformation, spiritual, physical, and political. And I'd written papers on PAS, the world government. You know, all the subjects related to the UFO phenomenon that uh, that I'd studied one at a time and then I'd spoken on for a year and then write, written, written a paper on. And he, was, he must have not been too uh, disturbed by what I was saying because he sent me an email invitation in, I think it was May of 2003, to be one of the 150 people invited to the Brussels conference, 18 to 20. June 93. The title of that conference was National Sovereignty and World Challenges, Choices for the World After Iraq. And you know, I was to be to attend as a director of the International UFO Congress, which, um, which I thought was kind of interesting when you see the titles of all those other 150 <laughs> participants. The, the conference was chaired by George Bethoen, who from 1975 to 1992 was the European chairman of the Trilateral Commission. Um, the uh, speakers were people like Air Marshal Sir Timothy Garden, who was the, the head of the Royal Institute for International Affairs, you know, the kind of uh, similar to our Council on Foreign Relations in the United States. and. Uh, Pat Cox, uh, the, the, the uh, head of the European Parliament, I guess, uh, just lots of other interesting people. The president of the, the uh, International Chamber of Commerce and, and James Wolsey and uh, really neat folks. <laughs> 
So uh, unfortunately, well, they were sending me background information that said, well, after World War I, we formed the, the League of Nations and that to keep peace in the world, and that didn't work. So after World War II, we formed the United Nations, and that didn't work. Now that we've had the first two battles of World War III, meaning Afghanistan and Iraq, it's obvious the Security Council can't maintain peace in the world, and, and NATO can't even maintain peace, and NATO's time for a change. And they were talking about something called community of nations. And, they had, and I, I had a prior commitment on those dates that I just could not break. As much as I wanted to go to that conference, I told him, I'm sorry, I, I just can't break the commitment. And uh, so he said, no problem. Why don't you make your input by email? So I did. And I was really, I felt honored when after the conference, he sent me a draft of the output document and asked for my comment on the draft. It, the draft title was, uh, was Integral Governance Initiative. And it outlined the, or described the the 20 most important problems of the world. I think they decided they're so critical they don't have time to even rewrite the charter of the United Nations to, to be able to effectively address those problems. So they're going to do it you know, one problem at a time with the same technique that they used uh, on the, the landmine ban treaty. You know, Lord Axworthy, the foreign minister of Canada with backing of the Canadian government, in not more than about two years, got 140 nations to sign that treaty. So I'm excited about the works that State of the World Forum is now working on to address the problems of the world. I, I, I really feel that I've had assistance in my education from what I call angels, aliens, and world government folks for the past 20 years. I'm now starting to recognize that I've been getting tasking messages from an unseen being using the name Adam for a number of years now, and I've had time to assess, assess the, the type of tasking I've been given. And it's, uh, it's looking more and more like it's a joint project between a group that are managing the transformation of this planet and other human beings who are willing to assist, like myself. So I'm now here at the Roswell UFO Festival for the first time. I've never been here before. And the MUFON is having a conference here. I've been attending some of their lectures. This morning I heard one on underground bases and tunnels. And uh, they were talking about how secret these things were and there's hardly any information about them. And I, in the Q&A session, I just happened to mention that my orders as a regular officer when I retired assigned me to report to Mount Weather in case of a national emergency and I was recalled to active duty. And I suspect the reason that I got those orders was that uh, there aren't very many retired fighter pilots who also have a master's degree in nuclear engineering. And it might be useful. It, the only thing that would cause a national emergency that would call, recall an old guy like me would be something involving nuclear weapons, I would think. So that's my rationale for why I received those peculiar orders. I also um, uh, has some information that has not been reported to my knowledge, unless I have a poor memory, uh, from a personal acquaintance named Gene, who said he worked for these uh, world leaders, which I heard somebody refer to as the black government, because they run the black projects, <laughs> the black budget projects, which I think most of it is budgeted by private money rather than taxpayer money. But, uh, you know, you can debate that question. He said he had been into Dulce Base, and he said that base goes down 4,500 feet below the surface. He said he had been in, he, he said he went to the White House and Eisenhower handed him an armful of papers that he didn't want the regular society to see, and he took them to the underground warehouse in Maryland. And his comment was, there is so much stuff stored there that's out of sight 
for the regular says they are not in the National Archives. Stan Friedman will not find them. They're in the underground warehouse. <laughs> so so uh, those are interesting comments I thought about, about that subject. The, um, the title of my most recent lecture, which I've only given once, it was last month in Gulf Breeze, for an organization called Unlimited Horizons, two and a, two and a half hour lecture, which uh, included 10 minutes Q&A. The title of that was Sharing Earth, Various Intelligent Species. And I actually talked about six intelligent species. You know, I, I, ref I know myself as an eternal spiritual being. Well, aliens are eternal spiritual beings who happen to be in physical bodies that don't look a whole lot like mine. And angels are, you know, messengers who are eternal spiritual beings that may or may not be in a physical body because you can't see them. Well, <clears throat> these two of these eternal spiritual beings are incarnated in physical bodies that are designed to be non-technological. And we refer to them as cetaceans or Bigfoot. You know, eternal spiritual beings or intelligent beings of the sea and intelligent beings of the land. Now there are more, so I'm told, more than one species of Bigfoot type creatures. You know, if you're in the Siberian forest, they call them Alma. If you're in uh, the Everglades, they call them skunk apes. <laughs> If you're where I live in Northwest Florida, they call Bigfoot, and I'm convinced there is a family of Bigfoot living on the Eglin Air Force Base Reservation. A lot of that largest Air Force Base Reservation in the world is, uh, is marked red. Nobody gets to go in there, they say, because there are unexploded ordnance in there, and it's not safe. But I think it's safe enough for Bigfoot to live there <laughs> without being disturbed. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, we invited Kwani Lapsaritis to come from Washington State, you know, the mountain man who wrote the book Psychic Sasquatch, March of last year to come and lecture at our local true seeker, regional true seeker group called Unlimited Horizons. And he said, I was hosting him, my wife and I, and, and uh, he said, I'd like to stay a few days and go spend some time in that Bigfoot habitat in North Walton County, Florida. And uh, I said, well, that's good because I've been doing some ivory bill woodpecker research. I actually saw an ivory bill woodpecker there fly across the river in my fourth day searching for that bird in, in a canoe. And uh, not many people have seen an ivory bill woodpecker that are still alive. Uh, although I did meet one people who, one person who's seen it 12 times since 1950 because he worked for the logging companies there. He's a card-carrying Creek Indian who owns 20 acres adjacent to the floodplain. Well, anyway, I said, look, I, I'm going to take my video camera and I want to spend a couple of nights in the woods in that Bigfoot, Ivory Bill Woodpecker type habitat. And um, so you can use your psychic ability to just try and call in Bigfoot and um, maybe in the two days he'll agree to come and make an appearance. And, you know, you can tell me whether he minds his picture taken or not, but I'm going to try to get pictures of an ivory bill if he flies between his nesting area and his feeding areas. So <laughs> this is our plan. And uh, Kwani is a, is a dowser. And he, dow he used his psychic abilities to put a spot on a map. Because I gave him a map of you know, the area I wanted to go in where the ivory bills are. Well... His spot was not in the floodplain where the ivory bills live. It was a little bit east of Morrison Springs, Florida. And Morrison Springs was a private uh, spring that's right, right has entrance into the Choctaw River. And uh, the county has just purchased it. And they were spending a lot of money building it as a county park. So we go there to launch my kayak, my inflatable kayak I carry around the back of my Prius, 
Well, first we go to the spot on the map where he doused, and this was about about a mile from where I wanted to go look for the for the ivory bill, and it was behind private property, behind a fence on private property. And I says, "No, we're not going to spend the night here." So we ended up uh, because we had floodwaters didn't let us get to the other side of the river. We ended up on the high ground in Morrison Springs State Park, where the construction was going on, and I got permission from the construction crew team and the sheriff to spend the night there. And they locked the gate. They had done a lot of plowing of the land and, and you know getting ready for parking lots. And they said, we're gonna lock you in tonight and we'll be back six o'clock to open the gate. And they said, okay, no problem. Well, I was awakened at four o'clock that next morning by uh, a couple of uh, great horned owls overhead calling to each other. And at 4.30, I was just listening to the the barred owls in the swamp and stuff, and I heard this really loud descending wail. I was about 100 feet sleeping under the stars from where Kwani was in a tent, and um, I know all the sounds of all the birds that nest or winter in Northwest Florida, or in Florida, and this was none of them. I've been able to find and identify 5,095 species of birds around the world and the only one that sounds anything like that is a peacock. And I know there are some people who raise peacocks, but nowhere near where we were, and there was no, no house, no farm, no habitat for peacocks. I'm sure it was not a peacock. I think it was a Bigfoot that had, had sensed the psychic input from, from Kwani and let us know he was there, even though he chose not to climb the fence, walk across that re fresh, freshly plowed ground and perhaps make an appearance. But I feel blessed by hearing what I think was the call of a Bigfoot. So uh, the other four species that um, call this planet home and have technologies sufficient to leave the planet, that is anti-gravity technologies, are Homo sapiens, and I think we uh, acquired that through the help of some Aldebarans in Germany in the 1930s. Uh, you don't hear people talking about that a whole lot. And then there are these little guys from Zeta Reticulum that are giving us the genes for the upgraded computer. And the offspring, we are told, by George S. Robinson although he never mentioned aliens, but he said, we humans have already created a new species called Homo alterio spatialis. Well, those are the guys that have to live separate from us folks here on the surface because our neighbors wouldn't choose them. So they're in the underground and undersea system that where all of our black budget projects are taking place or on our bases on the moon and Mars. So here's two species eternal spiritual beings and physical bodies that, that are different from each other, enough to be called a new species. And uh, the third species that has the flying saucers, etc., are um, referred to as the Dagon people, D-A-G-O-N, I think it is, or G-A-N, D-A-G-A-N, I think, I think it's spelled. And the best source for that information is a set of three books written by uh, Valerie Bonwick and Jonathan Begress, who live in Vancouver, Canada. The title of the first book is The Sea Gods After Atlantis. The second one is Teachings of the Sea Gods, and the third book is titled Training of an Adept, the Ladder Path. Not many people have found these books. They're not sold on Amazon. Whereas, you know, there are a number of books by George S. Robinson, the world lawyer who, who, uh, is, who helped our world government establish the laws that are being used on the moon bases and Mar our Mars bases and stuff like that. And the laws being used in relation to the aliens that are on this planet working on joint programs with us. It's, uh, 
it's amazing stuff. What what uh, is in the three books, if I can give you a little nutshell description. 10,500 years ago, the more selfish people in the Atlantean society had gotten control of the government. You know, the Atlanteans were from elsewhere. They weren't part of the, the, the genetically evolved Homo erectus line of intelligent beings on this planet. They were from elsewhere. And most humans on this planet were quite barbarian. And they didn't want to live with the barbarians, so they chose these islands that were separate from them. And there weren't any, I guess, other humans there. The other humans were on the, all, all the other continents. Well, when the more selfish folks got control of the government, the less selfish folks, what I call the fourth density society, those who are ready to learn to express unconditional love of others, became the opposition. And the government made political prisoners out of the opposition if they were caused too much trouble. And their prisoners were used to work in the mines. And they'd already mined out all the minerals and stuff under the Atlantean islands, so the, their tunnels extended out well under the oceans. And when the, when the earth traumas came and the islands went under, most of the Atlanteans left. They had anti-gravity technologies. A few of them stayed and tried to influence the Sumerian society and the Egyptian society and perhaps some people in South America. But their technologies did not stick. The, the, the population 10,500 years ago didn't have the capacity for intellectual growth to be able to keep that society at the level it was in Atlantis. However, the more spiritually oriented folks who were not political prisoners kind of hooked up with their, their friends that were in the, in the mines and uh, they decided, well, this is not such a bad place. We, uh, you know, we can use the caves that are, have openings to the sea. And they were living there, staying separate from the human beings that were more barbaric. And they eventually used their technologies to grow just the fruits and trees and vegetables underground with artificial energy sources. And eventually they built over time, 12 domed cities on the bottoms of the oceans. And they, they uh, uh, they decided that they would harvest the seas from the bottom and let the humans harvest the seas from the top, and we wouldn't interfere with each other too much. Well, they had little submarine-type things, underwater flying saucers, you might say, to go back and forth, but they wanted to be able to spend more time underwater. And so they were good genetic engineers and they genetically engineered some gills in their neck to allow them to stay underwater a lot longer than, you know, somebody just stayed underwater for 17 minutes on Oprah's show. But most people can't stay underwater longer than a minute or so. And, uh, and then since, you know, this was kind of fun and they had 10,500 years to experiment with things, they crossed some of their genes with the dolphins. They, cr they say they created the mer people. But at least some of these mer people were given not only the bottom half, like the tail of a, of a dolphin, but they also gave themselves feet so they could stand on dry land. And if, you, if anybody's ever read uh, Secret Teachings of All Ages by, by Manly P. Hall, I think it was, he published that in, what, 1928? He was probably the best truth seeker of the early er, first half of this century. Uh, he has a, a picture there of Oannes and a big story about how this, this mer person walks out of the water what was it, 5,000 years ago or so and in, in uh, Babylonia, and teaches all kinds of profound subjects to the human beings there. And every night he walked back into the water and disappeared. And then he comes back, and he did this for a long time. And, you know, he's pretty famous, this guy, Oannes, O-N-N-E-S, -N -N -E I think, or O-A-N-N-E-S, I think it is. You can Google that and read a lot about him. Um, so that's what th this is, and, and the, um, 
These Dagon people, you can see records of them influencing human society in other ways where the term Dagon was used. And now they recognize that there are human beings that are sufficiently oriented towards service to others and becoming sufficiently telepathic to be able to communicate with. And they have chosen Valerie to communicate throughout most all of her life. She's 77 now. So um, that's why I think a true seeker like myself and the people who watch your wonderful videos might want to check into those books that Valerie only sells there in Vancouver. The last, uh, one, one more, and then, uh, you know, you can ask whatever, <laughs> are, are um, the best source you can, f Google can find if you put Lacerta, L-A-C-E-R-T-A, which is the name of a 28-year-old reptilian creature, a cold-blooded creature, that says their people were genetically engineered by aliens from off the planet from the leftover of the dinosaur species many millions of years ago. They are the oldest intelligent inhabitants of this planet. You know, they, they see human beings as living on their planet. Some of the flying saucers we see, they say are theirs. Not many, because they don't, they don't like to interact with them. But they're cold-blooded creatures, and they don't like the temperature shift between day and night you have on the surface. They're very happy living generally 2,000 to 8,000 meters beneath the surface where they're not interfering with us. And they say that there are humongous caverns and I'm sure tunnels between caverns. They've got lots of space down there. <laughs> and, you know, it's, it's, it's a realm that we haven't gotten into yet. But uh, they are, I think it was 16 December 1999 when a uh, researcher in Sweden learned that one of these beings, this 26-year-old girl, had dressed, you know, put clothes on and made friends with a lady that lived in the cabin in the woods, I think, in Sweden. And this Lacerda agreed to, for an interview. And uh, there was two interviews, several months apart. The first interview is published on, condensed and published on 24 pages in many languages, which is on their website, which Google will find for you if you put in Lacerta. And the second interview is 20 pages. Well, there has been a long time acclamation program to, you know, by our world leaders to put information into the public domain so it's available for those seeking it without forcing it on those who are not ready. And I'm pretty well convinced that the video that was shown in England in the 60s or whenever that was, I don't know the date, that said, and, and had the little video clip that I think was real, that we put our first manned base on Mars in 1963. I think at least that part of, there may be some disinformation in that video to be used as a control lever to keep the general public from getting too excited about that video. And it worked. Nobody got too excited about the Alternative 3 video. You know, true seekers know what Alternative 3 means, but the general public didn't get too excited. So the, their system of acclimating the public works. The people that need to know it's there for them to seek it and find it. It was a smart guy that said that, you know, seek it and you shall find it. Ask and it shall be answered unto you. <laughs> I, think, I think you could probably see into the future a bit. <laughs> uh, and we had moon, bases on the moon before that. It's interesting that when George S. Robinson, the lawyer, first got to get the Ph.D. in civil law relating to space, mentioned the new species that we had made, and he said we made them for, to be more survivable on off-planet conditions, he mentioned our moon, Mars, and he said probably Europa, which I think is a moon of, what, Jupiter? Jupiter. 
Yeah. So I, I think in the future, in the next 10 years, we're going to be, see a lot more about uh, perhaps visits to Europa. And we'll, just like we're now seeing signs of life on Mars and on the moon, signs of people being there, bases there. You know, you can go Google Mars and you can get all kinds of weird stuff that's not in your daily newspaper. <laughs> You're going to be seeing it on, probably on Europa too. I've been getting demonstrations by unseen beings for 20 years. And um, I'm paying attention, yeah. Uh, besides the tasking messages, I, uh, you know, I'm not very telepathic. The first message I got from unseen beings was that I need to learn to sense the energies that surround people. You know, to, some people can see people's auras. Well, that was pretty far out for me, but, but I, I found out that uh, there really was something to that, and so I started working on it, and I think I'm getting much, much better at it. Now, I can stand within 18 inches of somebody who's telling me their story at a UFO conference and pretty well tell you whether they're telling the truth or not by the, the energy I feel from them. And uh, I, I think that's a blessing, but I would not have worked on that if this unseen being coming through someone who's more telepathic than I has said, I should do that, you know, directing it to me by name. And then in uh, 28 January 1992, I woke up at two o'clock in the morning with that video screen in my mind that had two sentences on it. First one was, no room in my mind for any other thought until I got up and wrote it down. And the first sentence said, unconditional love is becoming the driving force on this planet. And, this, and that, that's consistent with my idea of the transformation into a fourth grade classroom for the soul, where that's your reason for being. It's, it's different from what most people are here for, which is to use free will to make choices that polarize the soul. And the second sentence says, I am trying to learn to express unconditional love. Now, I think that maybe that's a clue from my spirit guides, my seraphim, that I'm on the right tracking in, in my thinking, and maybe I am a, third, a fourth grade student here. I think about a billion of us are fourth grade students on this planet. In the, in the, you know, the fourth grade is a little advanced from the third grade in the evolution of consciousness. Raw material, is, I think, is the best description of the, the levels of the evolution of consciousness. And there's seven levels. And the first grade, it, or first le density consciousness, and Ra said that the word density he prefers we use because it will be better understood by the scientific mind if you talk about a density of consciousness. He also said that, that he can only give us an approximation of reality because of limitations of the human mind. So, uh, second... Rocks have a form of consciousness, but it's consciousness that Deepak Chopra would say is asleep. And then animals and plants, trees, have a form of consciousness. You know, that's why tree huggers like to hug trees because they can sense some, some form of consciousness there. You know your, your dog and your cat are loving, conscious beings. They just don't have capacity for intellectual growth and spiritual awareness to be considered human. Uh, so third density consciousness is by definition homo sapiens sapiens. Reason for being, learning to use free will to make choices that polarize your soul. And everybody knows God gave us free will. That's what it's all about. That's what we're here for. It's unfortunate a lot of people think we're here to make money, but we're not. We're here to make choices. <laughs> Fourth density consciousness is where everybody on the planet will be a relatively unselfish soul. And they're here to learn to express unconditional love of others. And they're going to have to do that being able to read the thoughts of other people, having greater telepathic ability than most humans have now. You can't, you can't learn to express unconditional love of others fully on a in a third grade classroom because there are too many highly selfish people and they put out bad vibes and it makes you uncomfortable. 
So you have to be oriented toward service to others through your free will choices to learn to express unconditional love of others. And you have to get, you have to graduate from the fourth grade before you're ready with the fifth grade curriculum, which is developing true wisdom. So you have to be, um, and once you do that, I think Rod, Rod described the sixth density level, which he claimed to be after 2.3 billion years from his third grade level. Uh, he said, if you can imagine a hundred of these wise, loving souls melding into a sixth density soul that has the capacity to manifest whatever they choose by pure thought, a true galactic teacher that can demonstrate the kind of things Jesus demonstrated when that God became a man, or Son of God became a man, I guess. You know, he said he was the Son of God and he was the Son of Man. And, uh, and speaking of Jesus, uh, I am a serious student of the Urantia book. The early part of the 19th century that um, uh, Alice Bailey wrote 24 books. She would be getting all this information telepathically and she would on particular subjects and she'd write it down and publish them immediately. And collectively they're referred to as the ancient wisdom. I know the Lucis Trust has, has a mission to make sure that they, were, they are always available to the public, never sold out. And they have people in, in the Arcane School, which is under their headquarters, who uh, study those 24 books and write papers on certain subjects that are pertinent to current situations in our culture. And, you know, if people go to lucistrust.org or worldgoodwill.org, you, uh, you, can, you can find information available free online or you can order brochures to send out. They don't put a price on them. They just you know, say, make a donation and ask for whatever you want. Uh, it's, it's a neat source of information for truth seekers. Lucis Trust, L-U-C-I-S-T-R-U-S-T dot org or worldgoodwill.org. Uh, while we're talking about websites, I do want to make sure your audience knows that serpo.org is used to release not just information about the 12 Air Force officers we sent to the Zeta Reticulan planet, in 1965, but uh, about a lot of other stuff concerning the alien presence. I think that really is a, a group of DIA folks, some retired, some probably still active, who've been given permission to make the information available for those seeking it. I, th I think one of the latest entries on that, I don't know if you read it recently, but they told us about a vehicle, and a crashed flying saucer that was recovered in 1968, I think, by our world leaders, well buried well down below the surface in an in a, in a area of ground that was 150 million years old. This huge big flying saucer that had a bunch of, bunch of decomposed bodies on it. And several of the bodies were humanoid types from off, apparently from elsewhere. And there was a there was a skeleton, a full skeleton of a of a dinosaur on board that alien vehicle. Now, like you know, aliens pick up cattle. Or <laughs> you know, they, they apparently were messing with dinosaurs back then. That, you know, Lucerta uh, said that aliens genetically engineered her people from dinosaurs just like humans were genetically engineered from Homo erectus. Well, the Urantia book, you know, gives a great deal of information about the origin of Homo sapiens because the Urantia book answers all of the questions of the true seekers of Chicago in, in uh, the, the mid-30s when the questions were being asked. And uh, it says that about 994,000 years ago, two beings 
named Andon and Fanta, suddenly appeared to a Homo erectus couple living on the northeast shores of Africa. And everybody in the tribe knew that they were different from everybody else in the tribe. And they were living in caves on the ground during the daytime and in tree houses during, at night because of all the wild animals, back, you know, almost a million years ago. And Andon and Fanta, when they reached puberty, were inspired to take their prized possessions to their tree house that night from the cave and leave early in the morning before everybody else got up, separate themselves from the tribe, and start breeding kids. And that, they were the first humans, the first animals with sufficient capacity for intellectual growth and spiritual awareness to be called human by the watchers. And that went on for a long time, and the numbers went up and down, and you know they had their tribal wars and diseases, and the, you know the population was getting quite low, and it was time for an upgrade. So 500,000 years ago, the, they, in, they helped a, a couple in the northwest mountains of India develop six colored species, colored races, the first being the red man. And the red man was given more aggressive genes because they have to learn to survive among all the wild animals. They say this is the kind of thing that's done on all planets when the planet is ready for it, but ours is kind of a rush job. And you got, uh, you got a secondary species, I think they call it the orange man, and then the yellow man, and the green man, a secondary species, and the blue man, I think it's named after eye color, because it says a lot of them migrated up to the northwest, which is Scandinavian countries, and then the indigo man that had the darkest skin. And all of these went down to the Mediterranean, which is prime real estate on the, on the planet. They were designed to intermarry, intermingle, you know, spread their genes around so that survival of the fittest would work. And that went on for 300,000 years and, until uh, Lucifer and Satan, were, who ran the local star system, rebelled. They got the planetary prince who was living there between the Tigris and Euphrates to rebel with him, and he had 100 staff members who were in genetically engineered bodies to have greater capacity for intellectual growth and spiritual awareness than the humans on the planet 200,000 years ago. 60 of them rebelled and were restricted to living on the planet without the energy source that kept their physical bodies from aging. And they were the ones then told to go and breed with the daughters of men. Spread your genes into the human population as much as possible to upgrade our capacity for intellectual growth and spiritual awareness. And that, th that story got passed down by word of mouth for, you know, almost 200,000 years until it ended up in, in print in the Bible. And I think that's somewhat amazing. And obviously a little bit distorted, and you can understand why. We pass something down for a year and it gets distorted. <laughs> so um, uh, the last genetic upgrade was Adam and Eve, which we're told was, what, 30-some 30, 30 thousand years ago. And Adam and Eve, we're told in the Urantia book, is on the Council of Twenty and Four that you read about in the Bible. You know, in the last book of the Bible, John was taken out of body to that council and had, had a little chat with him. Well, uh, a number of other names are on that council that are managing the transformation of this planet. And those folks, they're working with a lot of people at this conference and International UFO Congress that we go to to help transform. It's a joint human alien angelic project. Transformation of the planet from a third grade classroom for the soul to a fourth grade classroom for the soul. Very logical. You know, I, I was an engineer and if I have one quality that I think I've, uh, you know, I've honed is pretty good, it's logic. And I talk, talk about a lot of weird things, but it's all logical. If you got an open mind. How do you nurture the uh, the ability to assist in the transformation, the positive transformation of the planet? You know, my definition of a light worker 
is someone who's working toward the positive transformation of the planet and has some idea of the context in which they're working. And, and I guess I do consider myself a light worker. In fact, Adam, in 1992, asked a lady that sends me a lot of messages by name to invite 20 people to a spiritual retreat. And these people were from Atlanta and Birmingham and Miami and all in the southeast part of the United States. She picked a central point, invited us all there, and uh, we were sitting around the pool in this hot, hot spring wondering why we were picked by Adam, who I now recognize as a member of the Council of 20 and 4, to, uh, to come there. And we decided the only word that could describe all of us was light worker. And it was just so we could get to know each other and help network. And I thought that was kind of neat. So I, we were all direct, you know, we were all given a symbol of remembrance of that, you know, February 92 event. And uh, that's that circle in the triangle with the little blue stone in it that I wear on my green jacket, which you might see me at. I don't wear it in Roswell because it's too darn hot. But, but uh, yeah. Um, the Lucis Trust, no, it's World Goodwill that publishes a little brochure. You may still be able to get it. I, I got some and made copies of it. It's called The Work of the Spiritual Hierarchy. It's probably the most profound bit of information I've seen on any eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. I'll give you a, co a copy of that too. I carry them in my briefcase. And it has six steps, which describes what's really going on and tells you in no uncertain terms about the power of the spiritual hierarchy and the, the world, you know, the world leaders that decide who gets nominated for president of our country or most any other leading country uh, because they groom people for these positions and then they, uh, you know, they, they control all the major media so they can they like to see close races because they're not sure who, who would be the best person for the job until about a month before the election because they monitor how all the world leaders think about the two leading contenders for president in the United States and some other countries, you know. And they know what the leading issues are going to be for the first four years of our president. And so they're sitting up there saying, this is how I view what's going on. They're saying, gee, can, can Hillary better solve this problem, you know, better work with these other major leaders she's going to have to work with on this issue, or can Brock do that? And they make that decision in the last month. That's why they like to see close elections. <laughs> and so they can use the major media to swing the election one way or the other. It's very easy to do. It's, you know, it's either what you don't print or what you do print. They can get a few votes here and there. They're, they're good guys. They're working for the positive transformation of the planet. However, they're working on rules that are well above the rules of any national law. That's why George S. Robinson came to the Cosmic Cultures Conference and under the title Homo Alterior Spatialis, the interdependence between extraterrestrials and Earth kind and said you cannot take any national law into space. You have to figure out what the natural or cosmic laws are, what laws pertain to us out there, to aliens down here, and to human alien hybrids here, there, and everywhere. That's profound stuff, but it's logical, it's real. And they are, the hybridization program is illegal. You could, you know, if you were a normal human being and you were caught and convicted, of picking up somebody's daughter and taking their eggs against their will or against their knowledge and genetically altering that egg and three and a half months later or, or later put re-implanting the egg and then stealing the baby uh, and the mother ne may never see the baby in a, in a case that she can remember because they, they know how to selectively block your memories of whatever they don't want you to remember. You can't, you can't Talk about that. The president can't say, yeah, I'm aware that we've got this joint program with aliens and this is what we're doing because you homo sapiens are suicidal. 
You're destroying the environment that supports all life on the planet. You got to stop it. And so this is what we're going to do. We're going to replace you with a being that has greater capacity for intellectual growth and spiritual awareness. And it ju we just happen to get the genes for the upgraded computer from the zeta reticulans. President can't say that and do the job we hired him to do. So they secret. You know, I. When I was in the Air Force, I was the top secret control officer for, the TAC, for a unit in the Tactical Air Warfare Center. And that caused me to be sent to the Industrial Security College. And I learned some important principles that I would hope other UFO researchers would think about. And one is the only person in a position to determine who should have a particular piece of information is the person that possesses it. If you don't have a piece of information, you're not in a position to determine who else ought to have it. It's logical. It's the way it works.